yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from the state of Florida, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Williams, do you want to take about 30 seconds to respond? It won't even take 30 seconds, Congressman. What I would say is if you know, we're talking today about what, what's within Congress's powers and duties under Article I of the Constitution, one such thing is legislation. If Congress wishes to pass bipartisan legislation, either about the Federal Elections Commission or lobbying requirements, have at it. That is Congress's role, and work together and do it. I would support it, and I'm sure many people in this room would. Alas, our, our first bipartisan agreement. No, I, 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 we're in agreement there, you're claiming, I think. You're claiming my time. Sorry, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Not from you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, first, I want to thank you, Ms. Parker. As a victim of the, of the Cesar Sayoc bomb package case, along with my staff, I appreciate your service and the work that you did in the, uh, in the Miami Bureau. Mr. Williams, you worked in oversight in the, uh, for a long time, as you noted, in Congress for the executive branch. You've seen it at its best and worst. And although the Judiciary Committee has issued subpoenas over unfounded accusations just two weeks into this Congress, I know I have serious concerns over their rush to judgment, like many other committee actions that are employed by Republicans for purely political reasons. But their move also clearly shows that when Republicans are in charge, they use the levers of power to weaponize government. So can you tell us some examples of congressional oversight that has been abused in that way? Well, what I will say, Congresswoman, is that when congressional oversight is abused, history doesn't treat it well. And we, none of us today are the judge or the guide, but history will be. And if, for instance, individuals are targeted, uh, the history will not be the judge of that if Congress is using its authorities to do so and overstep its bounds beyond the scope of, article, of its Article I authority. Thank you. And what, what can members of Congress learn from past examples of the politicization of oversight? I, I think past is prologue. Um, and by recognizing that with a large platform as Congress has, it has the tremendous ability to, um, to harm people as much as, it, as much as it does to do good. And Congress ought to perhaps have that in mind when thinking about how to make government work better. Thank you. In 2015, a member of Congress who happens to currently hold the gavel now in the House boasted that the Benghazi Select Committee was effective all because it hurt Hillary Clinton politically, saying, quote, everybody thought Hillary Clinton was unbeatable, right? But we put together a Benghazi Special Committee, a Select Committee. What are her numbers today, unquote? He even bragged in the same statement that because of it, her, quote, numbers are dropping, unquote. During Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign, Republicans held nine investigative hearings focusing on her, including one where they called her to testify for over 11 hours. That was clearly politicized and weaponized oversight. And frankly, this weaponization committee itself epitomizes the weaponization of government. So Mr. Williams, is it ever appropriate to turn congressional oversight authority into a weapon to harm a political opponent? No. And how can the politici politicization of congressional oversight harm the credibility of future congressional investigations? That's exactly the point I was going to get to, Congressman. It, it, if the public loses its faith in Congress's ability to be a fair arbiter of oversight disputes, the public, then what does Congress have, ultimately? So yes, um, this is about the integrity of Congress, I think. Thank you so much. Mr. Turley, uh, turning to you, have you ever worked for Twitter? No. Do you have any formal relationship with the company? No, I just have an account. Do you have any specific or special or unique knowledge about the inner workings of Twitter? Nothing beyond the Twitter files and what I read in the media. So essentially, your responses to the questions here today were your own opinion and pure conjecture. No, I wouldn't say that. I mean, they're based, I try to base them on what we know from the Twitter files. Well, but you said that you don't have any specific or unique knowledge of Twitter, but you spoke as if you did. You were asked very specific questions about Twitter's, uh, the way Twitter functions and the decision making that they, that they make, but yet you don't have any unique or special knowledge about Twitter and have never worked for them. And so this is only just your opinion, would you say, as a Twitter account user? No, I, I come to give legal analysis based on facts that are in the public domain, and I was really referring to what the, well, I was asked about the reclaiming Twitter Reclaiming my time, legal analysis is another word for opinion. I, well, I would, I would think there is some distinction, but yeah, it's all, it ultimately is an opinion, but I believe the question to me was based on what the Twitter files show, and that, that was my reading of the Twitter files. Right. 
And again, that's another way of describing your opinion being offered, which was represented as unique and special fact, which you don't possess. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time.